The previous administration contended that the European phased adaptive approach provided a flexible or adaptive plan that could be deployed in phases and could be adjusted as the threat landscape evolved. Since the plan's inception, Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the EPAA have successfully placed X-band radar in Turkey and Aegis ships in Spain and an Aegis ashore site in Romania. Phase 3 of the adaptive plan began in 2016, with groundbreaking for a new site in Poland aimed for completion by 2018. Throughout that time, the presence of missile defense capabilities, regardless of their orientation towards threats emanating from the Middle East, have proven to be a consistent irritant in the U.S.-Russia relationship and one of several vexing issues that have stymied further efforts at arms control. The current approach to European missile defenses emerged prior to the conclusion of the agreement to limit Iran's nuclear program, known as the JCPOA, and at a time when missile, th missile threats, uh, potentially even nuclear missile threats, from Europe, from beyond the European theater, dominated the European security landscape. Since that initial implementation of EPAA, the international security environment has changed substantially. The shifting security landscape has included, on the one hand, Russia's invasion and annexation of Crimea, its snap military exercises, including those involving mock attacks on European cities by nuclear-capable forces, and most recently, its cruise missile deployment, violating the INF Treaty. On the other hand, the boat has continued to rock, with Iran's finalization of the JCPOE nuclear deal, substantially delaying any potential Iranian nuclear program on the one hand, and it's continued, but has continued its ballistic missile testing on the other. So the threat overall perspective has shifted, and it is time for a relook. So now the spotlight has returned to European missile defenses, but views on the way forward diverge sharply. Some call for expanded missile defenses to bolster assurances to NATO partners. Others call for pausing the program before a site is built in Poland, in part as a means to de-escalate de tensions with Russia. Missile defense appears to be perched on a wire teetering between defensive necessity and diplomatic resolve. With these emerging and dynamic challenges in the international system, how does the United States and its allies decide to proceed? Fortunately, my job today is just to pose these difficult questions, not to answer them. The CSIS Pony program is designed to identify, encourage, and cultivate the next generation of nuclear experts and practitioners. That is our main purpose. As part of that mission, Pony, which I direct, seeks to sponsor thoughtful and respectful discussion and debate on the issues of the day, recognizing that we can only fully develop our own ideas if we possess a genuine understanding of the views of those who think differently. So this is very much in keeping with our broader educational and development mission within PONY, and we're very pleased to sponsor this discussion today. Fortunately, to debate the issues, we have a tremendous panel of experts to examine both sides of the challenging issues. So let me take a minute to introduce their bios, and then we will be diving right in. Speaking first in favor of expanded U.S. missile defenses for NATO will be Frank Rose, who recently stepped down as Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance. In this position, he was responsible for advising the Secretary of State on arms control strategic policy verification and compliance issues. Prior to this, Frank served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Space and Defense Policy where he was responsible for key issues related to arms control and defense policy, including missile defense, military space policy, chemical and biological weapons, and conventional arms control. Aside from working at the State Department, Frank has held a number of national security staff positions in the U.S. House of Representatives and numerous positions within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Also speaking in favor will be Tom Carrico, Tom is a senior fellow at CSIS with the International Security Program and director of the Missile Defense Project and a dear colleague right down the hall from me. In this capacity, his research focuses on national security, U.S. nuclear forces, missile defense, and public law. Tom is also an assistant professor of political science and director of the Center for the Study of American Democracy at Kenyon College. Before his time at CSIS, Tom was selected to be a Congressional Fellow, where he worked with the professional staff of the House Armed Services Committee on U.S. Strategic Forces Policy Nonproliferation in NATO. 
We have a similarly strong uh, panel uh, to present the arguments against expanding U.S. missile defenses for NATO. First to speak on that side will be Joe Serencioni, who is currently the president of the Plowshares Fund, a global security foundation. Joe is the author of hundreds of articles on nuclear weapons issues and a frequent commentator in the media. He previously worked in the U.S. House of Representatives and on the professional staff of the Committee on the Armed Services and the Committee on Government Operations. He is the author of the book Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late, and Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons and, and Deadly Arsenals, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Threats. I think I've got three books in there. They're romance novels. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy the happy topics, yes. And last but not least, we'll hear from Phil Coyle, who is a senior science fellow at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. With more than 40 years of experience, Mr. Coyle is a recognized expert on uh, U.S. and worldwide military research, development, and testing matters. He previously served as the Associate Director for National Security and International Affairs at the White House Office of Science and Technology under President Barack Obama. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Phil was appointed by President George Bush to the Base Realignment and Closure, Closure Commission excuse me, in 2005. He's also served as a former Assistant Secretary of Defense and Director of Operational Test and Evaluation at the Pentagon. Before that, Phil was an Associate Director at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California. Briefly, um, I'll just summarize how the, the rest of the process will unfold. The question that both, all, both sides of the panel will address is should the United States continue to expand European missile defenses for NATO? The ground rules are that each debate, each debater will have five minutes each for the opening statement for a total of 10 minutes per team. Following opening statements, I will ask each panelist a question and allow two minutes for a response. At the conclusion of the moderator questions, Team Rose and Carrico will have five minutes total for a rebuttal, followed by Team Cerrone and Coyle, who will have five minutes of their own, and they will receive, uh, have a chance to kind of rebut each other's questions. We'll open the floor to audience Q&A. We'll try to allow a reasonably equal number of questions for both sides, and then um, we will give both sides five minutes for closing statements. We're going to do our best to stick closely to the timelines. We have timekeepers in the front who will be keeping track of the hourglass, but it'll be like on an iPhone. Um, and they will be notifying the speakers via signs in the front row as they come to the close of their allotted time. So please save any comments, corrections, or interventions from one side or the other until the baton is passed back to you. So with that, I will happily pass that baton to our first presenter, Frank Rose, who will open the debate with uh, the case in favor of the current missile defense Great. program in Europe. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here with Tom, uh, Phil, and Joe. I've worked with all of them throughout my career. In my opening statement, I want to work, focus on three areas. The ballistic missile threat from Iran, the technical capabilities of the NATO missile defense system, and the implications of European missile defense for the U.S.-Russia strategic relationship. Uh, first, when the President uh, announced the European Phase Adaptive Approach, or EPAA, in 2009, he made it very clear that the deployment was about both the nuclear threat and the ballistic missile threat. Now, some argue that with the successful conclusion of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, there is no need to move forward with missile defense in Europe. While the JCPOA, which I strongly support, addresses the nuclear threat from Iran, it does not address Iran's continued efforts to develop, test, and deploy ballistic missiles. Indeed, since the JCPOA entered into force, Iran has conducted numerous tests of ballistic missiles, the most recent being on February 1st. Uh, furthermore, some argue that you don't need to worry about conventionally armed ballistic missiles. I would say all you have to do is look at 1991. In 1991, Saddam Hussein launched conventionally armed ballistic missiles at Israel with the strategic objective of bringing Israel into the war and breaking up the coalition. And it was the deployment of U.S., Dutch, and German ballistic missile defenses that helped manage the crisis and keep 
Israel out of the war. So conventionally armed ballistic missiles can have strategic consequences. Um, furthermore, while Iran has not yet flight tested a intermediate range ballistic missiles through their space launch program, they have all the building blocks in place to do that, number one. And number two, the trend is absolutely clear. Iran remains committed to its ballistic missile defense missile program and shows absolutely no sign whatsoever of scaling back that program. Therefore, it is critical that the United States, working with our NATO allies, continues to deploy capabilities. Uh, with regards to the technical capabilities of the system, uh, I would argue, and I agree with many of the criticisms of the long-range missile defense system, but. European missile defense is focused on the Aegis ballistic missile defense system. And I would argue that the Aegis system has uh, proved very effective. For example, in testimony in 2015, J. Michael Gilmore, the former director of the Op Office of Tests and Evaluation at the Pentagon, Pentagon stated, quote, testing has demonstrated that Aegis BMD 4.0 is capable of defeating short and simple separated medium range ballistic missiles and shorter range intermediate threats in the mid-course phase of flight for many realistic operational scenarios. Um, that said, I think there are always things that we can do to improve our missile defense capabilities. One of those is improving sensor capabilities. Now let me turn to my favorite subject, the implications of European missile defense for the broader U.S. strategic relationship. Some argue that postponing or canceling phase three of the EPAA will address Russian concerns and open the way for further bilateral strategic nuclear reductions. I highly doubt this for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, while Russia continues to believe New START is in their interest, they have shown very little interest in pursuing uh, further bilateral reductions and absolutely no interest in transparency or reductions in non-strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, furthermore, um, some argue that, you know, if you address the Russian concerns, those uh, will go away. But every time a change has been made to European missile defenses, uh, which the Russians have claimed was a big concern, they just move to the next concern. When the Obama administration canceled the third site, the Russians initially said they were in favor of the EPAA. Then within a couple of months, they turned against the EPAA. When phase four was canceled by the Obama administration, uh, the Russians quickly pivoted to phase three. So I have some real questions on whether the Russians are really interested in further nuclear reductions. And I would argue we may be at the end of the bilateral U.S.-Russia uh, reductions process. So let me stop there and turn over to Tom. All right, well, thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I'd like to say a few things about why I believe we should stay the course on missile defenses for Europe. Now, some changes may well be in order, but at a minimum, I believe the Poland site already under construction should indeed be completed. Missile defense is now an established part of US and many other nations' security architectures, and the threat is not diminishing. There's too many missile-armed actors out there and too much uncertainty to forego defenses entirely. And as noted in the 2010 BMDR, missile defenses contribute to regional deterrence. And the 28 member nations of NATO seem to agree, having made missile defense a core alliance mission that same year. But specifically territorial defense, not just for Turkey and Romania, but the populations and territory of all NATO, for which the deployment of the SM-32A will be necessary. And NATO reaffirmed this just, uh, just last summer at the Warsaw Summit. Now, when EPA was announced, it was praised uh, by many, uh, including as a victory of pragmatism, and that it would NATOize the system to strengthen the alliance, not divide it. That was Joe Simoncioni back in 2009. And you know what? He was right. But I believe that endorsement applies as much today as it did then. Nor does the Iran nuclear agreement, assuming it lasts, negate the need to continue. In 2009, President Obama noted that European missile defenses might be scaled back with a successful deal, but had the express assumption that it would include missile limitations. 
The same point was uh, affirmed by Wendy Sherman as late as 2014. We're not here to relitigate whether JCPOA should have had or could have had missile limitations in it. We have to accept that it didn't. The price of not having them in the agreement, however, is that they remain a going concern. But don't take my word for it. When Russia suggested a few years ago that the deal removed the need for European missile defenses, NATO strongly disagreed, as did John Kerry in his discussions with his Russian counterpart in 2013. In the words of NATO General Secretary Stoltenberg, the threat is real. And of course, keep in mind that the deal could go away. Some, for instance, have vocally expressed concern that President Trump might do exactly what he said he would do, which is to tear up the Iran deal, or could fail for a number of other reasons. <clears throat> we have a relative degree of confidence today about the prospect of a North Korean ICBM, should they get one, because of some limited missile defenses that we have uh, for that threat. If in a few years the deal collapses, and if Iran should go back to trying to get a nuclear weapon, or even within the deal, they should acquire longer range missiles from elsewhere, it would be better to have outpaced the threat than to chase it. Missile defense sites take years to build and deploy. It's not the sort of thing you can snap back into place like the sanctions regime allegedly will. Some have said that there won't be a nuclear armed, armed Iranian missile of any range for maybe 20 years. I happen to think we don't know what's gonna happen with Iran this year, let alone 20 years from now. Since the deal was concluded, there have been between nine and 13 Iranian missile tests. Shahab, Ghadr, Imad, a, a space launch vehicle, and a cruise missile. For these tests, Iran was rebuked by both the Obama and the Trump administrations. Now, the Iran problem is different and distinct from the Russia problem. What we ought not do is to compromise NATO's defense uh, on the slim hope that we might appease Russia. Some folks, I think, believe that the US is, just, is always just one missile defense concession away from making Russia happy, less paranoid, and less reliant on nuclear weapons. Just one more. Uh, I think Phil Coyle made some similar suggestions in a piece published this week. Uh, the same day, I think, that the New York Times reported about the Russian Glickum in violation of INF. I just happen to disagree. And I think the cancellation of phase three would undermine the NATO alliance, it would cause a lot of concern with our allies, uh, and it would do exactly nothing to improve relations with Russia. Of course, EPA has not been and is not about undermining strategic, uh, Russia's strategic forces. But precisely because missile defenses contribute to deterrence, I think we ought to consider how low-tier uh, air defense and theater missile defenses can contribute to deterring Russian aggression. That's why it makes sense today for NATO forces deployed in the European Reassurance Initiative to have patriots along with them. Even limited defenses can have strategic effect by buying time, complica complicating attacks, and improving the credibility of response. So in summary, I think we ought to stay the course. We ought to complete the site at Rijakova, and we ought to furthermore explore what sort of non-strategic theater air and missile defenses might further improve deterrence for NATO. Thank you. Joe, go ahead. Let's hear from the other side here. Thank you very much. Over again. Thank you. 34 years ago next month, Ronald Reagan promised that ballistic missile defense would make nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. It was a beautiful dream, but he was wrong. He was wrong in part because he was misled by Edward Teller, who promised him that he had back at his Lawrence Livermore laboratory a desk sized device that could completely eliminate the first wave of SS-18 warheads aimed at the United States. When I started investigating these Star Wars programs for the House Armed Services Committee back in 1985, it became quickly clear that the X-ray laser not only didn't work, it didn't even exist. It was just one of the stream of false claims made by missile defense contractors and proponents. It was the beginning of a dangerous practice now ingrained in our strategic discussions. Not just lying about weapons performance. That happens all the time. No, we treat missile defense as a symbol. We want it to stand for something more than mere military capability. It should demonstrate resolve or grand strategy or simply strength. But this is a dangerous illusion. 
Missile defense makes sense against short-range threats. We can remarkably shoot down short and medium-range missiles under ideal conditions. But there is no feasible defense of entire continents like Europe or North America. This is a fantasy. Making such false claims put at risk the lives of our troops when commanders think they have a protection that doesn't in fact exist and the lives of our allies. We have been warned for years about this dangerous illusion. For example, back in 1991, after a year of hearings and investigations, the chairman of the Government Operations Committee concluded that the $24 billion Congress had given the Pentagon for these programs in the eight years since Reagan's speech had been wasted. Scattered around the country, he said, are dozens of test facilities, half-completed projects, hundreds of reports, and the swollen bank accounts of a handful of defense contractors. But, he said, we were no closer to effective missile defense. The free electron laser did not work. The space-based chemical laser did not work. The neutral particle beam did not work. The airborne optical aircraft did not work. The list of billion dollar failures goes on and on. For decades now, officials have kept promising miracles and the Congress kept buying. We spent billions on space-based kinetic kill vehicles. They didn't work. Brilliant pebbles didn't work. Ground-based interceptors didn't work. Now, 34 years later, we're $300 billion in the hole. And we are no closer to an effective weapon that can reliably shoot down a long-range missile than we were when Reagan announced his dream. We've been foolishly pursuing the illusion of missile defenses, looking for some magical solution to the threat of nuclear weapons. The European phased adaptive system is the latest failed project of the bloated ballistic missile defense enterprise. It started out as a good idea. I praised it. Put systems that do work, the Aegis system that can in test shoot down short range missiles, up close to Iran to counter that country's short range missiles, the weapons they actually have. The problem comes in because they didn't know where to stop. To expand this system to shoot down intermediate range missiles is a bad idea. This is what they want to do with the new Polish site, but there is very little chance the system can reliably do that task. It certainly has never been tested under realistic conditions to do that. We have zero evidence that this system could actually work. So it's a good thing that Iran does not actually have an intermediate range ballistic missile. And an even better thing that Iran does not have a nuclear warhead to put on any of its missiles. And an even better thing that the Iran agreement ensures that Iran won't have a nuclear weapon for at least 15 to 20 years and won't ever have one if we do our job and build on this agreement. So it's time for the phase adaptive approach to actually adapt. Put the Polish site on pause until and if an actual threat develops. Don't lock in ineffective technology that will be obsolete by the time a genuine threat emerges. Yes, we have new challenges from Russia, yes, their deployment of cruise missiles is an unacceptable violation of agreements. But missile defense is not the answer. We have to push back against Russia, but the place to do that is not in Poland, it's in the White House. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Phil. Uh, thank you to uh, Plowshares and to CSIS for sponsoring this debate, and, to, to, and thank you to CSIS for hosting it. Uh, the Iran nuclear accord uh, concluded in 2015 has fundamentally improved U.S., European, and Middle East security. Iran no longer has a path to obtain nuclear weapons, and its missile programs are short to medium range and proceeding more slowly than expected. As a result, current U.S. plans to deploy interceptors in Poland and to expand ship-based Aegis missile defenses in Europe should be paused, that is, placed on hold. President Donald Trump has said he would like to improve U.S. relations with Russia. This will be impossible if the U.S. expands missile defenses in Europe. Russian President Vladimir Putin hates U.S. missile defenses in Europe and has given long speeches about how these defenses are upsetting the strategic balance. By pausing the deployment of further U.S. missile defenses in Europe, 
President Trump can show Mr. Putin that he's willing to take a French fresh look at what has been one of the greatest obstacles to improved U.S.-Russia relations and continued progress in arms control. President Trump should put deployment of the EPAA's third phase on hold and assess Russia's response. The pause would save hundreds of millions of dollars, um, perhaps even over a billion, in unnecessary costs and provide additional time to correct existing flaws and develop more capable interceptors if needed. The pause would not preclude the possibility of deploying phase three later if Iran began developing longer range missiles and resumed proliferation sensitive nuclear activities, there would be ample time to respond. From the outset, um, the European phased adaptive approach used the word adaptive for a reason. The system would be deployed in phases, which could be adjusted to the threat as it changed. President Obama said in 2009, if the threat from Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile program is eliminated, the driving force for missile defense in Europe, Europe will be eliminated. On January 25th, 2007, Lieutenant General Trey Obering, then head of the Missile Defense Agency, held a roundtable where reporters asked him questions via conference call. One reporter asked, what was the point of European missile defenses? What would, they, what would the point be if the supposed Iranian threat went away? and General Obering couldn't think of one. Thanks to the nuclear agreement with Iran, the threat has gone away. Now is the time to recognize that and to use this opportunity to try to establish better relations with Russia while also saving the Department of Defense hundreds of millions of dollars. The first two phases are complete and were designed to address Iran's short and medium range missiles. There is no need to extend that capability to longer range missiles that Tehran does not possess. The CIS, CSIS website shows the limited ranges of Iranian missiles, the longest of which can only reach southeastern Europe. The recent medium range test by Iran at the end of January does not change anything in that respect. As the French ambassador to the United States said uh, in May, what we have done is enough. Missile defense is not something that we should do just for itself, and, and it's just common sense to link it to a reevaluation of the threat. With Russia, the alarms went off in 2002 when the Bush administration called for large land-based interceptors, similar to those in Alaska and California, to be stationed in Poland with a radar, radar in the Czech Republic. Their purpose was to defend U.S. territory against nuclear-armed ICBMs that Iran didn't have and still doesn't. President Bush didn't know that a nuclear deal would be achieved with Iran that would eliminate eliminate the nuclear threat from Iran. And also in terms of engineering reality, President Bush was calling for a missile defense system that was not in the cards then and still isn't. President Trump should put deployment of the EPA's third phase on, on hold and assess Russia's reactions. He has an opportunity to try a new approach with Russia, an opportunity that Trump himself created. Well, I'll have the pleasure of a first round of questions for each of our presenters, and then they'll have a chance to, to offer a rebuttal as well. So there's a lot of really good and, and conflicting perspectives on the table. Frank, I'd like to start with you and go back to the issue of balancing the importance of arms control with other defense priorities. Um, you know, both uh, Joe and Phil have laid out a, a kind of a strong case to suggest that the, the uh, threat from Iran has diminished at least to some degree and that we're at a critical moment in terms of any prospect for arms control with Russia. Would continuation of phase three simply put the last nail in the coffin and shouldn't we care? Well, Rebecca, let me say a couple of things. One, I think there are some real serious questions whether Russia is interested in further reductions. Uh, Russia did not sign the New START Treaty in 2010 because they believe in a world free of nuclear weapons. That was about maintaining strategic parity with the United States, number one. Number two, they have expressed no interest whatsoever in dealing with the issue of non-strategic nuclear weapons, arms control, or transparency. And if you look at the Senate resolution of ratification, to the New START Treaty, the Senate said the next agreement needs to take that into account. Um, 
Number three, and I think this is really, really important. Uh, we need to maintain this balance in our missile defense policy with regards to Russia and arms control. And that's why I think it's very, very important we maintain the limited nature of U.S. missile defenses. Over the past four administrations, they have all said that our missile defenses are directed against limited threats from countries like North Korea and Iran. They are not seeking to undermine Russia's strategic deterrent. I think it's critical that we continue that policy. Uh, I think the recent change of the Missile Defense Act of 1999 was unhelpful, uh, as it will just increase Russian paranoia and not increase our actual capabilities. Therefore, I would strongly recommend that the new administration restate the longstanding bipartisan approach to missile defense, saying that missile defenses are directed against North Korea and Iran and not seeking to undermine Russia's strategic deterrent. So yes, I think there is a balance, and I think we need to have a very, very clear bipartisan approach, and we should continue that approach. Thank you. Joe, a related question for you. Uh, it seems that, at a minimum, if the United States was to pause mm -hmm. at phase three, this would likely be seen as a substantial concession to Russia um, and something that uh, the giving of something of great value to them. Is that something we could possibly stand to do unilaterally? Would that really benefit us or would we find ourselves in the situation of in essence giving away something of substantial value for basically nothing in return? Mm -hmm. It's not a concession at all to anyone. And remember, this system is not supposed to be about Russia. It's all about Iran. And insofar as you make it about Russia, that's where you start to split NATO unity. Everything we do here, particularly in response to recent Russian aggressive moves, has to increase NATO cohesion, not try to split it. Now look, it's very clear that this administration has been a fan of coordination with Russia of dialogues with Russia on various levels about various things. It's time we turn that to a practical purpose. Let's have some communication with Russia about our shared strategic concerns. They have legitimate concerns about the capabilities of this system being deployed on their borders. We have very real concerns about the weapons that they are deploying within their borders. We should be able to address these concerns. Do you want to shore up the NATO alliance? Of course you do. But be honest, the Poles and the Romanians don't care about ballistic missiles. That's what, not what this is about. They're not worried about an Iranian missile coming at them. What they want is US troops. They want a demonstration of the US commitment. They want a human tripwire so that should Russia take aggressive action against their countries, the United States will come to their aid. We have a dozen different ways we can demonstrate that without squandering a billion dollars on a system that doesn't work against a threat that doesn't exist. Tom, a bunch of technical issues have been put on the table about the efficacy of the system, the whether or not, excuse me, repeat that. Tom, a bunch of technical questions have been put on the table about the efficacy of the system whether it can actually meet the technical challenge that it's been given. Um, I think, would you be able to sort of address that? Can it really meet the task? And related to that, how disruptive is this to strategic stability when we take into account the practical and technical considerations of the missile defense program? Well, I think on the, uh, specifically focusing on the Aegis program, uh, I think it's had uh, an exceptionally successful uh, record, uh, 28 of 37 or 28 of 34 uh, intercepts. That's not bad, depending on how you count. Uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's doing very well at the kind of mission it was designed for. Uh, and that's exactly why, by the way, the second half of that question is, you know, will SM3s of any kind in Europe disrupt the strategic stability? I mean, it is so, it's not even a close question. Uh, and I'm especially fond of quoting uh, two women on this. First, Condi Rice, who says that, you know, what we're doing, both GB GBIs and SM3s, this isn't Star Wars. This isn't even the son of Star Wars. It's not even the grandson of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, Rose Gottmuller, who when faced this question in Bucharest in 2014, said, 
you know, we don't even have as many interceptors, uh, GBIs, uh, as Moscow does uh, around them. And they're, they're pretty clear about the mm -hmm. fact that that's about us. Uh, so it's not even a close question. They're just not fast enough to chase IBM, ICBMs over the pole. They're not in the right place. They're not fast enough, and there's not enough of them. So I think it's, it's, it's really a canard. Russia's real objection here uh, is more political than it is technical. Uh, and it, at the very bottom of all this, they really object to the idea that these countries on the periphery are independent. Uh, it's really the, the idea, I think, of sovereign equality of their neighbors that they really object to, uh, as opposed to being subjects uh, of the czar. And, and Phil, for you, Iran has continued to test um, its missile program. There have been uh, multiple tests. It's clearly that that missile program remains substantial concern to the current administration on the Hill and, and elsewhere. Uh, I understand that the JCPOA certainly did um, put at least on hold uh, the nuclear risk. But explain why you feel there's sort of a technical mismatch between even the Iranian threat that these uh, systems are targeted, and, and, and why that isn't, why, why you feel this is not well suited to the problem at hand. Uh, the latest uh, um, missile test by Iran did not uh, show any new capabilities that, that they didn't already have in terms of range and, and, and effectiveness. Uh, it was another relatively short range uh, test. Uh, so, it, it really appears that Iran is not trying to build missiles that can reach Europe, least of all the United States. And of course, it would be suicidal um, if they were to try to do that. I mean, just imagine if uh, Iran were to attack Europe, let alone the United States. Um, Iran does a lot of crazy things from my point of view, uh, but they are not suicidal. Uh, if they would attack Europe or the United States, the retaliation would be so massive, and they know that. Uh, a U.S. president who didn't want to retaliate would be under so much political pressure to, to retaliate that there would be uh, just absolutely massive retaliation. And Rand knows that, and that's why they're not trying to build uh, long-range missiles. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn next to the rebuttals by both sides. As I do that, I'll remind the audience we're going to be coming to you in about 10 minutes as soon as they've done five minutes of rebuttal each. So prepare your questions. Remember to keep them very short, very crisp. As you can see, the speakers are certainly adhering to every time limit, so we want to get as much out of this as we can. So while you're getting ready, I'm going to turn first to the team of Rose and Carrico. Um, please uh, offer your rebuttal again in support of continued missile defenses in Europe. Uh, th thank you. Um, Rebecca really warned us to stay on time. So, uh, you know, I think my, my overall uh, response to some of the, the uh, arguments on the other side is that they really, really do sound stuck in the 1980s. I mean, the talk, I mean, the talk about the, the X-ray laser and this other stuff. I mean, that is so far removed from what is going on in the in the world today. Um, and furthermore, the, kind of the, the idea that, that missile defenses don't work in, in practice in, in, in the real world uh, is belied by at least uh, two major events. One in 2003, uh, every ballistic missile that uh, Saddam fired that the United States attempted to, the United States uh, engaged during the 2003 conflict was, was defeated. Uh, what? No, the <laughs> cruise missiles were not, but every ballistic missile engaged was defeated. And second, uh, have you heard of Ye Yemen? Uh, there is a lot of ballistic missiles being fired from Yemen to both the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis uh, that are getting uh, defeated all the time. And, you know, we, we're ignoring that conflict, but there's a lot of real-world action going on there. Uh, and I think I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. that one, more, one more small point that uh, on the 2A, you know, that doesn't work. February 7, it had its fly-out intercept test, and by all accounts, it seems to have performed marvelously. Yeah. Let me just follow up on Tom's comment with regards to technical capability. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remark, there have been challenges with many missile defense systems, specifically the ground-based mid-course defense system. However, the Aegis system has worked effectively over the last decade. Uh, we have received numerous reports by the Independent Director of Operational Test and Evaluation 
uh, highlighting this fact. Even Phil Coyle, who's not the biggest fan of missile defenses, has said a few good things about the Aegis BMD system. Uh, for example, on December 7th, 2006, he stated, quote, the U.S. Navy has an enviable track record of successful flight intercept test and is making the most of its current limited Aegis missile defense capabilities. So I don't disagree with Phil that there are challenges in the missile defense program. When I was on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, I went after a number of these missile defense programs. But I think the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense Program has an excellent track record, number one. Uh, number two, uh, Phil mentioned in his remarks that, quote, Iran would be suicidal to attack Europe with ballistic missiles. And the point I would make is you don't necessarily have to use a ballistic missile for it to have a political impact. Indeed, one of the reasons why Iran, North Korea, and other countries are developing these capabilities is because of the intimidation factor. Uh, being able to say to publics that we will rain fire on your territory. And that creates political problems. Therefore, having effective missile defenses is a way to respond <clears throat> to intimidation and coercion. It's not just about the military capabilities. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, would you or, or Phil like to kick off your rebuttal? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, while uh, American and, and NATO officials uh, keep telling Russia that the EPAA is not aimed at Russia, with each passing year, it appears to Russia more and more that the EPAA really is uh, aimed at Russia. As George Lewis uh, points out, by the late 2030s, the US could have hundreds of interceptors <coughs> threatening Russia. Uh, as many as 650 SM-3 interceptors, either based on Aegis ships or in Europe or elsewhere, and capable of being re relocated on short notice. Hundreds of deployed US SM-3 interceptors would begin to match one for one uh, the number of survivable Russian ballistic missile warheads under New START, or even exceed one for one Russia's survivable nuclear arsenal mm -hmm. if Russia would agree to further modest cuts. For Russia, this would be much less acceptable than the current situation, which Russia has been complaining about for years. Um, th there's an old military adage that the only purely defensive weapon is a foxhole. Hmm. And the Aegis BMD system uh, illustrates that. SM-3 missiles are launched from Mark 41 vertical launch systems capable of firing offensive, possibly nuclear-armed, Tomahawk cruise missiles anti-ship and anti-submarine and other kinds of missiles, as well as SM-3s. The Mark 41 is the launcher on Aegis ships and also for Aegis ashore in Romania. Romania. Um, accordingly, Russia has no sure way of knowing whether U.S. missile defenses in Europe are defensive or, or offensive. The language of the INF Treaty is perfectly clear. If a launcher has been tested for launching offensive missiles, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that launcher which shall be considered to be being used for offensive missiles. From a Russia point of view, the Mark 41 makes the EPAA out of compliance with the INF Treaty. To resolve this matter will take time for negotiations with Russia as provided for under the treaty, time enough that a pause in phase three of the EPAA is, uh, is justified. Uh, also, I have to add, Mr. Caracos' uh, proposal to expand the EPAA to include integrated air and missile defenses against Russian aircraft and cruise missiles deployed at additional Aegis Ashore sites makes it clear that the EPAA would indeed be aimed at Russia. Mm -hmm. Missile defense is the longest running scam in the history of the Department of Defense. That's why history matters. I have a quaint notion for someone in Washington. I believe that facts matter. 
and you have to be able to prove that your system works. You like this system? Fine. Let's go operationally test it. Let's put it up against a real world threat and you show me that this sucker can actually intercept an intermediate range ballistic missile deployed with decoys and jammers and countermeasures. You show me that and I will publicly eat this report <laughs> here with you. I don't believe it. And we shouldn't have to base this system on faith. We should be able to test this thing and decide whether it works or not and then decide whether there's a threat existed. And here's the problem. You go ahead with this thing. You know what it's going to do? It's going to prove that this was all about Russia from the beginning. The Russians, are you think they're going to sit back and just watch as this deploys? They're going to keep doing what they're doing, try to divide NATO. Everything Putin is doing is trying to divide NATO. And guess what? NATO is nervous. NATO is confused. We are in a political crisis in this country, in this city, the likes of which none of you have seen in your lifetimes. And don't think NATO's not watching. And then you go ahead and you go do this. You say, forget that stuff about, the, about Iran. This is really about Russia. We have to show resolve against Russia, so we're going to deploy this. And then you take some of these ideas and you go deploy something else. We have to have systems to counter the cruise missiles. Let's go build anti-cruise missile defenses. Don't exist. That hasn't stopped us in the past. Let's go deploy them. Or let's go do interdiction against those those cruise missiles. And let's go do what Senator Tom Cotton wants to do. Let's go put new nuclear, crew, new, new nuclear weapons in NATO. Now, there's a brilliant idea. You know what happened when we did that in the 80s? The biggest mass demonstrations to Europe had ever seen against the, U, new, the Soviet and, Russia and US arms race. You want to divide NATO, you want to see those demonstrations again, you want to splinter the alliance, then just keep with this program. Start deploying new weapons, new capabilities in there. Watch how Russia plays us like a fiddle. Get smart. Don't let Russia manipulate us into crushing the most successful security alliance the world has ever known. OK. Have you got your questions ready? All right, let's see some hands. I'll take one from each section. We'll go around. We have about 20 minutes. So I'm going to start at the right, and I'll work my way in. Please be sure to say your name and affiliation, and then pose a brief question. Hi, I'm Terry Hopman from Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, I have both a technical and a political question that are related. Is there a technical reason why a deployment in Romania or Poland is particularly useful from the point of view of an effective defense against an intermediate range missile? And if not, why then wouldn't anyone in Russia perceive the deployment on the borders with Russia as a threat to Russia, uh, particularly in the light of our renunciation of the ABM Treaty and therefore take countermeasures of their own? Okay, great question. I'm going to take one from this side and then we'll offer a chance to respond one to each side. So right over here, please. I'm uh, James Kiesling. I'm on vacation today. Um, my basic question is, is the panel aware that uh, there is additional historic context that when we uh, turned down the Russian offer for the joint use of the radars at Amavir and uh, Gabala, that uh, that was renouncing a uh, offer that we ourselves originated to the Russians in 1997? So we essentially convinced the Russians that our intent in Europe was nefarious not defensive. Okay, so that's several good questions on the table. I will turn yeah. here for a couple of quick Great. responses as you choose, then I'll do likewise over Great. here. Great. Uh, well, let me address your uh, proposal uh, or question first. Uh, I actually was in the Clinton administration, the Pentagon in the late 90s, and in the Bush administration. I'm bipartisan in my support for missile defense. Um, with regards to their proposal in 2007, um, the administration, the Bush administration, did not reject that. Uh, what they said is that we would be prepared to work with you as a complement to NATO missile defense. Putin proposed that as a replacement for the Bush administration's third uh, site. So let's clarify that. Now, furthermore, uh, both the Obama administration 
and the uh, Bush administration and the Clinton administration tried for many years to try to get missile defense cooperation with Russia. Uh, the key objective was not necessarily to use their systems. I mean, their systems were okay, but there was nothing we needed. Uh, the objective there was to try to make it clear that missile defense, and especially European missile defense, is not about Russia. It doesn't have the capability or sophistication to deal that deal with that. Now, here's the problem. What Russia wants is legally binding limitations that U.S. and NATO missile defenses will not be a threat to its strategic deterrent. For a number of reasons, most importantly, the U.S. Senate would never agree to such limitations. That was not on the table. But with regards to actual deployments, those deployments have been limited, it's very, very clear that we don't have the capability to undermine their deterrent. Uh, and I think it's very important, as I said earlier, that we continue that longstanding policy, but also our deployments in a way that are limited to deal with threats from North Korea and Iran. Uh, with regards to your question about why Poland and Romania, according to very, very smart people at the Missile Defense Agency, that was the optimal location for putting interceptor sites to deal with threats from the Middle East into Europe and potentially in North America. Uh, we. Uh, both in the Obama administration and in the Bush administration had been very clear that we were prepared to be transparent with Russia. We were prepared to cooperate with Russia, but none of those transparency or cooperation proposals were acceptable. As one Russian official said to me, quote, we're not going to give you the rope to hang us with. Um, it reminds me of this old saying when dealing with the Russians, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. Just real quick, um, I'll just actually take the, the, the other question since uh, Frank handled that. Uh, you know, I continue to be amazed at the suggestions that no matter how low tier you go, uh, it's still a threat to Russia. Air defenses aren't aimed or threatening Russia. They're aimed at the things that Russia would aim at NATO. And so the national air defenses that Germany or any of these other countries, or Poland, they're not about the North Korean Air Force, right? They're a hedge against air, air breathing threats of various kinds. Uh, and so I just, I, I, I think that at the very least, when I turn that around and say, if Russia is gonna object to everything, all the way down to the lowest, shortest range uh, air defense interceptor, ought we ought not to at least level that same charge against its pretty robust air defenses and, and A2AD bubbles all around there, S300, S400, and so on? Okay. Want to respond to some of these questions yeah. that put here, uh, and then we'll yeah. take a few more from the audience. Uh, yes, with respect to uh, whether or not Poland uh, is, is a good location, um, uh, uh, you're correct, uh, it, it's not the best location. I think the GAO has reported uh, that, that it's not an optimum location and, and has said that it would be better to have uh, uh, those defenses uh, stationed on an Aegis ship uh, in the White Sea or the Baltic Sea. Of course, Russia wouldn't like that any better. Um, um, the problem is that we, we treat missile defense uh, as for, for its symbolic nature. Uh, we deploy missile defenses in places b as a way to respond. Uh, North Korea does something, so we move the, the floating X-band radar closer to, uh, to uh, Hawaii or something like that. Uh, it, it's symbolic, um, but uh, when it's in the case of Russia, they have to respond, um, especially with U.S. officials, uh, members of Congress and all, uh, saying these systems actually work and these systems are going to be effective and you better worry about them. Um, uh, so uh, all you have to do, I think, to understand Russia's point of view is imagine if that they were starting to install missile defense systems in Cuba 
uh, or Mexico or someplace, uh, we wouldn't like it any better than the Russians like them in Romania or Poland. I hear the Mexicans are actually starting to talk <laughs> about this. Just real quickly to, to your question first, but you have to understand, see, this is the problem you get in when you start treating missile defenses as a symbol, as some chip that you're putting on the board. Why is it in Poland? Because we want to reassure the Poles and the Baltics that we have a, a real commitment to their defense. There are lots of other ways to do that. You know, you could station more troops there. You could, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of a military buildup in Europe, but a conventional military buildup is a lot better than what people are talking about now with new nuclear weapons and new, new, new uh, missile defenses. This gets into an escalatory cycle that you really don't control. It is so much easier for Russia to win that cycle than, than it is doing some of these other things we can do, such as stationing uh, troops. And here's the opportunity. Some of us, some of the people in this room um, might be going into the Trump administration. I wish them well, because this is going to be the challenge of their lives. But Trump has a unique opportunity here. As a Republican president, he can make deals that a Democrat pre Dem Democratic president couldn't make. He can, in fact, address these problems with Russia. I do not believe that Russia is not interested in further nuclear reductions. They have bills they can't pay for defense, just as we do. It would be in Putin's interest to drop down another third or so. And it could be in Putin's interest to pull those cruise missiles back. It, but in order to do that, in order to get those things, we're going to have to do some things that he wants taken care of, too. I understand that we don't believe these systems are a threat to Russia. Here's the problem Russia does. I'm convinced. It's not just a maneuver they're making. I think they really do see a threat from there. And from their point of view, there are reasons to feel threatened about this. And our assurances don't work. They want something. But here's the good news. We can give up this Polish site, not go ahead with it. And it doesn't cost us anything because it doesn't provide a real military capability. It doesn't really increase our security, but an arrangement with Russia that reduced the nuclear threat, that reduced the tensions between our two countries, now that is a deal that would put Trump in the history books. Okay, I've got about 11 minutes, so I'm gonna take a couple more questions. One right here. Hi, Rachel Oswald, Congressional Quarterly. Could you talk a little bit about the political and military connections between the deployment by Russia of the cruise missile and the NATO missile shield, um, and to the extent that you see the deployment of the cruise missile shield of the cruise missile as a reaction to developments to Russia's east. Okay, good question. Hang on, we're going to get a couple. I've got one in the middle. Greg Tillman, board member of the Arms Control Association. Uh, Frank mentioned 2009 is the time when the, the schedule for European phase adaptive approach was set out. It was obviously based on threat projections, which have proven dramatically uh, exaggerated. Uh, for years, we assumed uh, an Iranian ICBM in 2015, actually up until about two months before 2015. Uh, they have uh, not tested a uh, IRBM range system. They are way behind in the Samorg space launch vehicle that people worry about uh, providing technology. Do, do either uh, Frank or Tom expect an Iranian IRBM before 2020, for example? I mean, two years after uh, the phase three, uh, it, it has an initial operational capability. Thank you very much. There was a figure cited, uh, $300 billion. I'm Randy Neal with Navy International Program Office. Okay, there was a, there was a figure cited for $300 billion of waste. It is, so, it is, it is too bad that <clears throat> most of that was aimed at Army and Air Force programs. Which portion of that was a Navy program? So with that, um, why don't I give, give you a minute on that one since 
I'll start over here to answer some of those Great. questions. And we'll try to be quick. Well, let me address Rachel's question. Um, many of you are probably aware, and I was at the Pentagon at this time, in 2005, Sergei Ivanov, then the Defense Minister of Russia, proposed a joint withdrawal between the U.S. and, the I, uh, and Russia from the INF Treaty. Um, Russia's concerns about the INF Treaty go back a very, very long time. And when you look at how long it takes to uh, develop a system, they probably started developing the system probably about 10 years ago. So this has been ongoing for some time in my view, number one. Uh, number two, uh, what we have also seen is, yes, does it have something to do with missile defense? Maybe a little bit, but the Russians have seen uh, a degradation of their theater strike capability, and this ground launch cruise missile may be one way to close that, quote, capabilities gap. And there's also a survivability issue. Um, they have been developing air-launched and sea-launched capabilities, which have been in, uh, demonstrated in Syria, but you can shoot down an airplane, you can sink a ship. It's very difficult to find mobile cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. And then finally, um, I would not underestimate Russia's long-term concerns about China. Uh, I remember several years ago when I was hosting a dialogue with the Russians on space security, and we thought we would be cute and brief the Russians about Chinese anti-satellite capabilities. It was the best briefing I participated in in my eight years in the State Department, uh, because watching the Russian reaction was fascinating. Then at the end of the uh, presentation, one of the Russian colonels got up and said, Mr. Rose, we're concerned about what you're doing in outer space. They think we have the Death Star circling the Earth with the objective of undermining Russia's strategic deterrent. I agree with Joe. The Russians really believe this. Uh, however, he said, but we're even more concerned about what the Chinese are doing. And my response was, you should be. So, Rachel, the answer to your question is, does the missile offense have a, a, a role? Probably. Uh, but what I would argue is that there are larger strategic issues at play here, and this new ground launch cruise missile is part of that. And I would further state uh, what we are seeing is, in general, a Russian rejection of the Euro-Atlantic security architecture put in place in the late 80s and early 90s when they were, quote, perceived as weak, uh, though I would argue that they still see value uh, in the New START Treaty, but primarily because it provides parity with the United States, limitations on U.S. systems. Uh, I am not as optimistic um, as Joe, given that I've been working with the Russians for almost two decades, as to whether they really buy into this process of further reductions. We will see. Perhaps Trump will look into Putin's eyes and get a sense of his soul, as all presidents, I remind my Republican friends, uh, We'll see, uh, but I have my doubts. So I'll, I'll take uh, Greg's question, and I, I might not say what you expect me to say. Uh, the question is really um, if it's about an Iranian ICBM or Iranian IRBM. And I hope it's the case that Iran neither, it never gets uh, an ICBM. And I think actually the posture that we ought to be assuming is to use every means at our disposal to, to remain seized of the matter and take every means at our disposal to counter that, kinetically, economically, sanctions, right? We ha have to first put ourselves back in a position to decide that's something we want to oppose and roll back and accomplish that thing, which unfortunately the JCPOA wasn't able to accomplish. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ash Carter last year said, you know, he wouldn't be surprised if, if Iran had an ICBM in 10 years. But nobody knows, right? Anybody who, who says they're, they're, they do know is, is, is not telling the truth. So nobody knows. Uh, obviously, the IRBM thing for Europe is a lot potentially closer uh, than, than the ICBM. But I think, um, 
uh, on that front, you know, actually, you might listen to, I forget whether it was Joe or, uh, or Phil who said, don't worry, the SM32A can handle uh, uh, all the ICBMs uh, the Russians can throw. So if that's the case, maybe we ought to deploy them to, uh, to take care of the, uh, the Iranian uh, threat as well. I think it was facetious. Somebody, somebody said that. No, in terms of the, uh, the George Lewis comment you about the, uh, the two Clarify that, yeah. Okay, uh, to the parochial question from the Navy. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> By my estimate, we have uh, spent about $300 billion since 1983 on ballistic missile defenses. It's the, that money, and this is all kinds of defenses, in my view, that money was well spent on improving the Patriot, which failed miserably in the 1991 Gulf War, but the Army's done an admirable job of improving. All evidence is that that is an effective system against short-range threats now. It was well spent, well, mostly on THAAD, a very problematic program, but, but the test results seem to indicate that it has some considerable cap capability, but best of all, it was spent on the Aegis system, <laughs> which is probably the best ballistic missile defense system we have right now against short and possibly medium range threats. The rest of that money, down the missile defense rat hole, just, just wasted, really nothing to show for it. 34 years later, we do not have an effective system that can reliably defeat a long range ballistic missile particularly one that's deployed with decoys and taking countermeasures, all our test results, all our evidence of long-range ballistic missile success depends on the enemy cooperating with us. <laughs> that they shoot the kind of system in the kind of configuration in the way that we expect them. And if they do anything different, forget it. You're not going to be able to hit it. Okay, I, I'm sure there are many more questions. I hope you'll have a chance to kind of engage the panelists as we go. But for right now, I want to give them the chance to offer their concluding statements. Uh, we'll turn first to the Rose and Carico team, and Serencioni and Coyle will get the last word, and then I will say a benediction. Uh, so. <laughs> I thought I was the Catholic here. Okay. <laughs> so with that. Well, let me just be very brief and then turn it over to Tom. Uh, I'll come back to the three points I made at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, first, Iran continues to develop and test and deploy ballistic missiles. Nothing has stopped since implementation of the JCPOA. While I strongly support the JCPOA, Iran continues to develop ballistic missiles and even conventionally armed ballistic missiles, as we saw in 1991, uh, can have strategic consequences. And I would note with regards to Joe's uh, criticism of the performance of the Patriot in 1991, that was an air defense capability. It, they deployed what they had. It really wasn't a missile defense capability. But you use what you have, and I would still argue even those limited capabilities played an important role in keeping Israel out of the war. And had Israel entered that war, the consequences might have been different. Uh, second, and I would support Joe on this point, the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense System works. There are challenges with other missile defense systems, such as the GMD system, but Aegis has a very, very strong track record. And finally, um, U.S. missile defenses are not directed against Russia, nor do they have the capability to undermine Russia's strategic deterrent. I am very skeptical that were we to uh, cancel or suspend the phase three of the EPAA that the Russians would move forward with additional reductions. Uh, I would argue they would probably pivot to say we need to do away with the radar in Turkey and um, the Aegis Ashore site in Romania. Uh, that said, I think it is very critical that we continue our long-standing policy that U.S. missile defenses are directed against limited threats from countries like North Korea and Iran and are not directed against Russia. 
Okay, uh, well, just real quick, uh, my argument is to stay the course on the EPAA. Uh, I think, really, to continue the, uh, the last question I took, uh, first, we have to remain seized of the problem with respect to uh, Iran. And I think that, in many ways, we've really relaxed our, uh, relaxed the tension, right, a good, healthy tension and concern about the, the program. And I would ask, you know, it's not going to be easy to renew missile sanctions uh, on a multilateral basis against Iran. You hear talk about that on the Hill right now. Uh, I think that those who may oppose uh, the need for more expensive missile defenses in Iran, I hope they'll join me uh, in endorsing uh, more robust uh, sanctions uh, and other means to roll back the Iranian missile program. Second, I do want to very quickly answer a couple of points. Uh, the 2003 was the Patriot record I was uh, referring, not 1991, and that was a perfect uh, engagement rate. THAAD, moreover, is 13 for 13 of the operationally configured system. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, and second, you know, I would again concur about the Aegis system. Uh, the remarkable uh, success rate there. But I've got good news for you uh, that if uh, uh, MDA goes forward with the redesigned kill vehicle for, uh, for, for GMD, well, guess what? It's going to leverage a, a lot of the components from the SM3. And so, in a way, you get to uh, a kill vehicle that has the same kind of reliability uh, and intercept rate of, of an SM3. That really, I think, changes the calculus. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, Phil. I just want, in closing, I just want to recall um, some recent history. Um, uh, it was in 2002, not that long ago, that uh, Russia and the United States uh, uh, reached uh, agreement on the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty, the SORT Treaty, also called the Moscow Treaty, uh, in, in which the United States uh, pledged in what was called the Joint Declaration with Russia, uh, May 24, 2002, to conduct joint research and development with Russia on missile defense technology and to cooperate jointly with Russia on missile defenses for Europe. Think about that. To, co to cooperate jointly with Russia on missile defenses for Europe. Well, what happened next was a couple of months after that, the Bush administration began talking with Poland and the Czech Republic about stationing um, missile defenses in their, in their countries. These were uh, unilateral actions not taken uh, jointly uh, with Russia, as we had agreed in the joint declaration. And naturally, Russia saw it, saw it as a betrayal uh, by the United States of that, uh, that treaty. Uh, uh, taken almost before the ink had dried on the joint declaration. U.S. missile defenses in Europe have been a problem for Russia ever since, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Thank you. The good news is that since we started negotiating with Iran for the nuclear agreement, the Iranian missile program has slowed down. In the four years since we started those negotiations, they have averaged about two tests a year compared to five tests a year beforehand. And all independent uh, analysis of the Iranian ballistic missile program indicates that it has fairly limited objectives at this point, aimed more at the region than at Europe or the United States. So we can take this adaptive system that was designed to go in stages, first stage, protection against the short-range th threat, second stage deployment in Romania against a slightly longer threat, and we can stop it here because that's the threat that actually exists. This just makes sense. We can put the Polish side on pause, not to please Russia, not to curry favor with Iran, but because of our own military needs. Let's be smart about this. Let's not rush ahead with its deployments in Poland now that would lock in a technology that's going to be obsolete should a real Iranian threat emerge. We know that it would take Iran at least two to three years to develop a working intermediate range ballistic missile. We can deploy missile defenses faster than that. We can stay inside their decision loop. Let's be clever about what we do. Deplo going ahead with the Polish site now would be the worst of all worlds. We would be deploying a system that doesn't work against a threat that doesn't exist with money we don't have, and we would be stimulating an arms race 
in Europe. It wouldn't be Iran that would respond to this. Iran has shown no signs that they care about this missile defense system. It would be Russia that would respond. Russian military leaders who genuinely think this represents a threat to them would argue that they need to, to deploy counter capabilities. You get in that escalatory cycle at precisely the time we don't need to. Let's be smart about this. Let's be smarter than Russia. Let's deploy the kinds of weapons we need against the threats that really exist. Let's use our resources in the smartest way possible and not for symbolic or ideological reasons. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to thank our panelists for putting forth a vigorous and thoughtful discussion of the issues. I want to thank uh, you for being a fantastic audience, extremely attentive. I want to be sure to thank Plowshares in particular for co-sponsoring this series of debates with the Project on Nuclear Issues and partnering with the idea that we want to bring together these diverse views and have a vigorous and respectful discussion. Um, I think that there's really no time uh, more important nuclear issues, broadly speaking, and also including issues like missile defense are figuring rather mm -hmm. prominently in the national debate. And uh, I think we are very interested, as is Plowshares, in making sure that there's an open dialogue, a public and inclusive dialogue on these, uh, on these issues. With that in mind, we expect to have a series of, of debates coming up over the next year. Uh, the next two will take on different aspects of modernization. They'll be occurring over the next you know, kind of month or two. So please uh, keep a look in your inboxes and, uh, and your mailings from us, and we will keep you posted on that schedule should you wish to attend. Um, by way of benediction, I would say uh, that when we were in the back room preparing to come in, uh, Joe said, well, a successful debate is one in which we can vigorously discuss the issues, you know, passionately state our views, but still be able to go out afterwards and enjoy a cold beverage. I think that's a, a close approximation of what you said. Yes. Yes. And so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we will have the opportunity to do that in part um, for the uh, reception that has been provided by Plowshares. And so you'll have an opportunity to um, have some dialogue, talk to the panelists, talk to each other, learn more about uh, Pony. And uh, we look forward to talking to you in the atrium on the other side. Joe, do you have any other comments want, in your plowshares? Uh, I just hat. wanted to thank you very much for being such a <laughs> gracious uh, host for this. I want to thank our, our opponents for a vigorous and, uh, and respectful debate. I think this was a great discussion. And what I actually said was, let's go have a drink <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and I'm looking for something gin-like. <laughs>